Program director, if you really had 250,000 people here, I would give you my dream. <laughs> President Paul Kagame, His Excellency the President of the Republic of Rwanda, Chairperson of the YPO, Mr. Pascal Gherkin, Executive members of the YPO, Mr. Scott Modell and Paul Berman, ministers and deputy ministers who are here, the member of the Executive Council of the Western Cape for Economic Opportunities, Ms. Beverly Schaefer, members of the Young President's Organization, members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great honor to address this important dinner tonight, a dinner of accomplished business leaders and their spouses from across the globe. And I'm told that there are some 93 countries that are represented in this conference that you are having. Welcome to beautiful South Africa and especially and especially to our mother city. Cape Town is the most beautiful coastal city in the world and we call her the mother city for a whole host of reasons and I'm sure you have felt the motherly warmth of Cape Town already, so you are most welcome. We are pleased that you chose South Africa as the host of your conference, your leadership conference. It is my pleasure to welcome all CEOs and other business leaders who are here, but more especially to, to welcome a very special CEO a CEO of an enterprise called Rwanda Incorporated, and that's President Paul Kagame, very special CEO. It is my hope that you will use the opportunity when you are here in Cape Town to learn more about our country, but also to learn about our continent, from direct observation and engagement with all of us. The Young President's Organization represents a significant body of opinion in business all over the world. You are holding your conference at a time when the investment environment around the world remains challenging and uncertain. On the global scale, it is said that the key risk is that global GDP growth has peaked with the G7, the Eurozone, and China growth expected to dip into 2020. As global growth appears to be weakening, the trade tensions continue between the US and China, and we hope that they find a solution soon. Political risk is increasing in both developed and emerging markets. And there are also other new challenges. Debt levels are increasing in a number of areas, both in government as well as in the corporate world. So these are conditions that are tightening. And uh, there are issues that we need to be addressing on an ongoing basis, because uh, monetary conditions are becoming tight. And short term, as central banks are also becoming a little bit hawkish. What about Africa? The African Development Bank says that the medium term growth in Africa is projected to accelerate to 4% in 2019. And though lower than China's and India's growth, Africa is projected to be higher. 
than that of other emerging and developing markets. The World Bank's report on the prospects for the growth in Africa says that the numbers that are being bandied around <clears throat> really belie the enormous diversity that is to be found in Africa and that a number of countries on our continent are showing impressive growth prospects. Ethiopia is on a track to have nearly the highest GDP growth rate in the world, and several other economies like Tanzania, like Kenya, Rwanda, and Ghana are growing at rates over 6%, a number on par with higher than, that is on par and higher than China's growth. These countries, as we look at them as fellow sister countries on the continent, we see them as touch bearers for Africa's economic growth, as they are also successfully attracting global capital through the progressive policies that they have embarked upon. And we are very proud that we have a class of countries on our continent that are taking a number of other countries along with them. As we all seek to emulate them, we all seek to see what they are doing best and also try to copy them. This conference that you are having here is taking place at an important and opportune moment in the history of our own country, South Africa. South Africa has entered a period we call a period of renewal, a period of unity. We say this because we've emerged and are emerging from a difficult period, not only of poor economic performance, but also a period where public trust in state institutions and low investor confidence were the order of the day. We have been forthright in acknowledging the effects of corruption and what we describe as state capture on our economy, on our institutions, and generally on our people. We have taken decisive steps to bring an end to state capture. We have taken also a decisive step to bring corruption to an end, to rebuild our law enforcement agencies so that we can end corruption and obliterate it to the dustbin of history, and also bring to an end the mismanagement of our state-owned enterprises and to ensure greater policy coherence in our economy and in our public institutions. Now, as we work to correct these mistakes and missteps of the past period, we are focusing on lifting economic growth and creating jobs. We have embarked on an ambitious investment drive with the target of $100 billion of new investment over the next five years. And as a result of these efforts, South Africa is firmly on a path of growth and renewal. We draw strength and encouragement from our partners within the global business community and some of our partners are amongst you here, and we thank you for being our partners because you want to see South Africa succeeding. You want to see this country that has had a horrible past being successful. Each time I talk to President Paul Kagame, he always says South Africa must never fail 
We want South Africa to succeed because that is the store of the hopes of many people also on the continent. Now, we are also heartened by the many companies, both local and international, who see South Africa as a country alive with opportunity. We are well aware of the deep social and economic challenges our country faces, including widespread poverty, unemployment, and also inequality. Yet, we are not daunted by these challenges nor complacent about the difficult work that needs to be done to overcome them. As we build a new future for the people of our country, we look to our past for both perspective as well as inspiration. South Africa is a diverse, and as I said, beautiful country with a resilient people and a proud history of struggle against injustice. Even in the darkest days of apartheid, our people never, ever gave up. And they never gave up hope. In part, they never gave up hope because they knew that they had the support of many billions of people around the world who were abhorred by the racist policies of our past government. So in our having hope and never giving up that hope, we knew that we were well supported by many people around the world and people on our own African continent gave us support in many, many ways, material, political, and otherwise. Our people merely fought harder with greater determination to achieve a durable constitutional democracy, which they achieved 25 years ago. Just as they defeated an iniquitous system of racial oppression, the people of South Africa are today acting in concert to address the social and economic legacy of that system. They are working together to build an inclusive economy, an economy that benefits all South Africans, irrespective of the circumstances of their birth. We are here this evening to invite you to become our partners on this journey of inclusive growth, which will create employment, reduce inequality, and offer business a meaningful opportunity to make a positive impact in society. We're also inviting you to invest in a South Africa that is world-class infrastructure, hosting the largest cluster of air and maritime transportation companies on the African continent. We have the most advanced ICT infrastructure in Africa, with internet and personal computer penetration being the highest on the, in the region. Many companies are attracted by the relative costs of doing business in South Africa, <clears throat> underpinned by the availability of skilled labor, a, su a supportive operating environment, and a highly sophisticated banking system. We are determined to further improve the ease of doing business in South Africa and have set our, ourselves the target of being within the top 50 countries ranked in the World Banking Doing Business Report within three years. That's what we are aiming to try and achieve. We are currently ranked at 82 out of 190 countries. So within six years, President Kagame, we are determined to catch up with Rwanda.
It's, it's wonderful to have a top performing country in a, on our continent like Rwanda because we can emulate them. We can learn from what they are doing, but they also have an added problem because we are running after them and we will catch up. <laughs> so we say, wake up and keep going because we are going to catch up with you. In doing all this, we realize that yes, it will take an extraordinary effort by the social partners in our country, from government, departments and agencies through the to business and trade unions. Yet extraordinary efforts will be required if we are to create jobs at a rate that our people need to lift themselves out of poverty. One of the most important requirements for economic activity is the reliability of affordable energy. Now, South Africa has been experiencing electricity shortages in recent years as our energy utility has faced severe financial and operational difficulties. It was also admittedly also subjected to state capture and some of the challenges that we are having to deal with is the way it was captured by business interests to serve their own purposes. We have embarked on a series of immediate measures to stabilize the electricity grid, to ensure that our electricity utility can meet its financial obligations, and also to restructure the utility to make it more efficient, transparent, and accountable. And we're seeking to benchmark it with a number of other utilities around the world which have been able to address the challenges that they have faced in the past. And through these efforts, we are certain that we can ensure security of energy. We're also working to drive growth both by expanding our export capacity and increasing local demand in our goods. We've established a number of special economic zones that are directed towards the export market. And importantly, companies can benefit from the proximity of related value chains and industrial and logistical infrastructure if they participate in these zones. And as a support mechanism to potential investors across the country, government has put in place an attractive package of incentives. And they support a number of initiatives that these companies seek to embark on. And there are a number of other opportunities in sectors that range from green energy, and we've been the leading country in renewable energy on the continent with regard to using solar, wind, and other renewable energy mechanisms. There are also great opportunities in agriculture which we are pursuing, now, South Africa also has extensive capabilities in science and technology with research institutions that are doing fantastic pioneering work in a broad range of disciplines and has constructed, and some of you may know, that just 500 kilometers north of this mother city, we have the Square Array a telescope, the radio telescope, the largest in the world, where we're working in conjunction with a number of countries, especially Australia, as well as the UK. We are working to develop the skills of our people that they need to harness their participation in the fourth industrial revolution. Now, investment is crucial to enable us to access new technologies and approaches that merge the physical, digital, and biological worlds. One of the most exciting developments in recent years, which happened during President Paul Kagame's chairship of the African Union, was the adoption by African leaders of the agreement to establish an African continental free trade area.
Now, this free trade area is going to have almost 1.2 billion people as a market, where Africa will now be integrated, where Africa will be trading with itself, where Africa will be buying and selling goods amongst the various countries and where the borders that even exist on the African continent with regard to goods and services will begin to melt away. But where, for instance, the trade will possibly go up to $2 trillion, and that is the market that is opening up, not only for Africa, but also for would-be investors from outside the African continent. Now, in the past decade, Africa has grown at a rate of 2 to 3 percent points faster than the global GDP. The growth of African economies has been supported by increasing foreign trade, investment flows, and also skills that we've been acquiring. Now, the establishment of this free trade area will create this huge market. This is in the context of the expectation that Africa's working age population is likely to double to one billion in the next 24 years, surpassing in terms of working population both China and India. This is no doubt a matter of great interest to yourselves as the YPO, which has expanded its presence in Africa in recent years with over 700 members on the African continent with 21 chapters across the continent. Now, I, I would add what many other people have been saying, that Africa is indeed the next frontier of global growth. It has vast untapped potential and a huge appetite for investment. We encourage you to explore the opportunities that exist not only in South Africa, but also across the continent. Now, I want to conclude by voicing my appreciation for the emerging perspectives of the members of your organization, which were expressed, as I believe, in the YPO Global Leadership Survey, which was released in January this year which said that an overwhelming 93% of YPO affiliate CEOs believe that business must play a greater role in making a positive impact on society for the benefit of the people. Now, I applaud this because this perspective has led me to think of five tasks that I believe the YPO family needs to be preoccupied with, seeing that the majority of your members believe that business should make an impact on society for the benefit of all the people. I believe that business should adopt a contrarian posture to Milton Friedman's maxim that said that the business of business is business. The business of business should not just be business. Focus should on profits alone should not be the yardstick that we use in business. Instead, we should make share stakeholder value the benchmark of a company's performance. This talks to focusing on recognizing the challenges that people of the world face and also crafting a shared future in which their challenges are addressed. Now, the World Economic Forum, which many of us try to go to every year, had a wonderful theme in 2018, which said that we need to create a shared future in a fractured world. This was a recognition that the world is facing many challenges, but as business leaders, we should create a, a shared future. 
Today's stakeholders, <clears throat> customers, shareholders, suppliers, employees, community leaders, religious leaders, and when you come to our continent here in Africa, where we still have people living in traditional societies, traditional leaders, and just in general, society, in fact, society as a whole, they rightfully expect companies to assume greater responsibility. For example, by protecting the environment, by being advocates of climate change, fighting for social justice, aiding refugees, and training and educating workers. These are the new tasks that companies now need to embrace and to deal with. This is the way the world is going, as the majority of your own members have said in your survey. Your members, and I associate with that, to a point where I'll be willing to join your organization anytime you want me to. Now, the business of business sh should be to create value for society. This is a task that business leaders cannot ignore. The second task, because the fourth industrial revolution runs on knowledge, we need a concurrent revolution in training and education. Here, both government and business must join forces to provide workers with the skills and qualifications they need to participate in the digital economy, for instance, by ensuring that they are able to tap the opportunities created by artificial intelligence. I say this advisedly because I recently chaired a commission together with the Prime Minister of Sweden where we were dealing with an issue which we called the future of work, where a clear task was identified by both business government and trade unions that in the end what employers should really be doing is to assist working people on their journey of lifelong learning so that they are able to cope with the challenges that the fourth industrial revolution is going to impose on the world. In other words, they should skill their workers, reskill them, and upskill them as well. The third task that I believe you now have is we must encourage innovation to fuel economic growth on a continuous basis with new products and services Business needs to lead in this regard. You should never leave research and development just to governments alone. You, as businesses, must be the ones who lead the charge. The fourth task, as leaders, we must summon the courage to address tough issues, tough questions, and there are plenty of them. How can we secure the future of those jobs that will be eliminated by machines is a tough question. Maybe it affects your business, but you need to be engaged with this issue. How do we create new sectors of the economy? Because the fourth industrial revolution is going to yield a number of new sectors but it is also going to destroy a number of others. We need as business leaders to keep asking ourselves what those new sectors will be. And how do we address the challenges of widespread unemployment? Because unemployment is a huge threat, not only to governments, but also to your own businesses. We therefore need to be engaged with this question on an ongoing basis and ask ourselves as companies, by embarking on this project, 
Are we going to create jobs and how many jobs will we create? Are we going to contribute to the loss of jobs or creating more jobs? The fifth and the last task is business must remain engaged with all the key stakeholders and especially government. Relationships between business and government are often fraught with conflict. A business or businesses must always have the courage to engage government and collaborate with government even as it might seem impossible or difficult. Business, however, should not seek, should not seek to capture government. I repeat, business should not seek to capture government. Because we in South Africa have seen how when businesses capture government, it ends up very badly. It becomes a total disaster, not only for government, but for ordinary people as well. And part of this task means that business must never be found wanting when it comes to adherence to the best of ethical values, to integrity and ethical behavior. And I say this advisedly because in our own country, as we've been going and finding our way through the state capture, blue chip companies, the bluest of blue chips, were found caught up in the web of state capture and were caught having done unethical things or deeds. And I say to this wonderful collection of people here, as the YPO, it is important that businesses must continue to be the standard bearers of good ethical behavior and the best moral rectitude at all times. In other words, business must rid itself of corrupt practices and be seen to be dealing with corruption effectively itself. Now, those are the first five tasks that were really inspired by this survey that 93% of your members came up with in terms of a new perspective. And it is this perspective that encapsulates those five tasks that has embraced, that have been embraced by important players in global business around the world. I am pleased that gathered here within the four walls of this hall tonight are men and women, members of the YPO, who are astute and who are very much aware that we all have a responsibility to work for sustainability and inclusive growth, and that as we run our businesses, we should also focus on the benefits that ordinary people can have. Let us all work together to make this world a better place for all the people who live in it. That is our collective task, and I thank you for listening to me tonight.